Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. This has been a historic week by any standards in the annals of world diplomacy. Iran and the United States, or rather Iran and the E3 plus 3 or the P5 plus 1 reached a landmark agreement which will hopefully put to rest international concerns about Iran's nuclear program and also begin the process of ending the isolation of Iran because of sanctions by the UN, the European Union, and the United States. Joining me to discuss this week's agreement between Iran and the P5 plus 1 is Professor Steve Miller of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Thank you very much for joining us on Rajya Sabha TV. My pleasure to be here. The Iran deal has been something uh, which Barack Obama has made a top priority. Uh, he got off to a slow start in terms of his engagement with the Iranians, but uh, ever since Rouhani became president, things have moved at a fairly high speed. And in the last year and a half, it seemed as if the Obama administration has pulled out all the stops to ensure that uh, they reach a deal. Why is this so important for Barack Obama and for the U.S.? Well, you know, if you put it in a wider context, uh, the United States has been concerned, at least since the middle of the Clinton administration some 20 years ago, that Iran's nuclear activities were leading it in the direction of a weapon. Uh, and uh, the United States is generally opposed to nuclear proliferation, but it's particularly concerned about a state like Iran with which it has very negative uh, relations and where it's, it is seen as a kind of rival and uh, troublesome player in a very important region of the world. So the U.S. has been struggling for a long time to get, get a grip on this uh, potential threat. Uh, for, a, for the longest time, the effort was to pressure Iran uh, in order to force it, basically, to stop and reverse its program. Uh, this was the policy of the Bush administration. It was the policy that was more or less continued in the early part of the Obama administration, although Obama introduced a, a more substantial element of diplomacy. Uh, but that uh, policy failed, basically. Uh, uh, so the era of nuclear-related sanctions uh, over the last dozen or so years uh, since this uh, issue came to the head of the kind of international agenda uh, resulted in a world in which the Iranians had 20,000 installed centrifuges. 9,000 of them were They kept operating. growing and growing throughout the century. They centuries. kept growing. Yeah. The, the, the uh, slope of Iran's centrifuges went like this. And uh, on that chart, you could draw the lines like this, and it was this sanctions resolution, that sanctions resolution, the next sanctions resolution, and the curve just went like this. So uh, uh, maybe there was some point at which Iran would have broken and capitulated, but we never arrived at that point. Uh, there was, as many people will recall, serious consideration of the military option. Uh, it's sort of a standard uh, mantra among American that all uh, options are on the table. All options are on the yeah. table, and there have been phases uh, of this crisis where it was thought that a uh, military uh, strike uh, was edging into reality. Um, and of course, the, the Israelis uh, uh, have their own concerns about Iran and were uh, uh, serious contemplators of the right. military option. So, uh, what we see here is the culmination, basically, of a couple of decades of struggling to find a way right. of constraining Iran's yeah. military nuclear uh, option. Uh, for Obama, I think uh, it's also uh, a major foreign policy success. It's a legacy uh, issue. So I think these guys have been interested, this particular subset of the Iranian elite has been right. interested both in a deal, but, uh, but, but perhaps more importantly in re repositioning Iran. Right. Uh, in the international yeah. setting yeah, uh, for I, a long I, I time. Want, I wanted to pick up on that aspect because I know it's difficult to disentangle America's military concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, some would say that those concerns have been exaggerated in the past and there have been differences of opinion within the U.S. establishment, but they have been there on the table. But if we disentangle those concerns from the wider geopolitics, mm -hmm. uh, for Obama, how important is this deal uh, from the point of view of opening a new path for you know, America to work in a difficult mm -hmm. region mm -hmm. with a country that has traditionally been U U.S.'s ally before 
right. the 79 revolution. So in other words, uh, is he looking at the nuclear deal as, as something which takes a problem off the table and then opens the door for a much wider kind of engagement? Or is it purely uh, a military strategic issue that he's trying to deal with right now? Well, I think that the, the approach that they took was to, to demarcate the nuclear question as the paramount issue because of the importance of okay. preventing the nuclearization of Iran uh, as, a, as a military power. Um, but the president, even in the last 24 hours since the deal was announced, uh, has uh, already said that, that there's a potential here for, right. a, for an opening with Iran. I think it will be a, a mixed picture, though, because uh, we're going to have a, a serious debate in the United States. There's going to be a lot of criticism. The Congress is going to have 60 days to yeah. examine and criticize. Okay, we'll come to that in a second. Yes. But uh, I mention that uh, in this context yeah. simply because there are going to be a lot of people in the Washington scene, including proponents, who are going to be saying we have to resist uh, Iran's uh, right. ambitions in the region. Uh, we have to... So the selling, the selling of yeah. the deal right. may generate rhetoric even. Well, well I think both rhetoric and yeah. behavior. That yeah. is to say, there will be an effort in Washington okay. to signal right. that we're not going to turn a blind okay. eye to Iran's misbehavior, right? right? right. And there's also going to be, uh, to anticipate a number of, another of your questions, there will be a serious effort to reassure our friends and allies in the region. Right. And both of those will, will mean that the, that the uh, rivalrous aspect right. of U.S.-Iran relations will right. remain present. Right. But what, what may turn out to be true is that getting this nuclear issue off uh, the agenda or setting it aside and boxing it off in ways that make it less urgent uh, will allow us to cooperate in those areas where our interests are compatible. Okay. One of the things that the Iranians have complained about for quite some time, and they took it as a very serious signal of American intent, uh, because I've been involved uh, over many years with these track two uh, dialogues with Iranian colleagues, uh, so you learn a lot from those exercises. And uh, what, I, what I often heard was Iranian colleagues saying, America's hostility to Iran, its relentless, implacable hostility, is revealed by the fact that you won't cooperate with us even when it's in your interest to do so. Iran's public enemy number one on the international stage was Saddam Hussein. They would have been happy to cooperate with us if we hadn't also framed that as a, as a threat to them. Yes. Uh, Iran had its own issues with uh, the Taliban and in fact were quite helpful in the early stages right of American involvement in Afghanistan. Uh, Iran uh, was very much at odds with Al-Qaeda, uh, and uh, you know, which regarded the, the Iranians basically as Persian infidels right. uh, in the kind of great game within uh, Islam. Uh, so there are a number of respects, and today, uh, both Iran and the United States are counterpoised against uh, the Islamic yeah, State uh, in, in Iraq. Uh, but we always uh, had limited or no uh, cooperation with them on these issues, and where we did fleetingly cooperate, it was always very temporary and completely right. tactical, right? So, 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 so I think that the, now there may be more room for cooperating with Iran in areas where we have correct. harmonious interests. Correct. So, so a door is opening, undoubtedly. Yes. But let's look uh, for a second at factors that might lead to that door slamming shut again. Mm -hmm. uh, the contours of the deal which, have, which has been agreed to mm -hmm. are quite complex, but in, in, in broad terms, it, rep it requires Iran to uh, curtail its enrichment program. Mm -hmm. uh, heavy water reactor uh, will be uh, remodeled. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be much more intrusive inspections. The additional mm -hmm. protocol of the IAEA will be implemented. Yes. Uh, Iran is committed to giving a, a much more full accounting of its previous activities, including yes. so-called possible military dimensions, which is always okay. contested. In return for this, the U.S., the EU, and the U.N. will be withdrawing sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, there, is a, there is a provision for those sanctions to snap back. Now, where in this complex set of assurances and counter-assurances do you reckon there are dangers of uh, the deal falling through or running into trouble? Well, there's, uh, there's 
substantive questions, and then there are uh, political and diplomatic okay. uh, questions. Uh, substantively, uh, it's, it's invariably the case that there are compliance issues with arms control agreements. No matter how hard negotiators uh, uh, try, there are always gray areas or, or uh, uncertain right. uh, provisions and so on. And in areas of, in contexts of high levels of distrust, uh, there's very little benefit of the doubt that you right. give to the other side. Right. Uh, so, um, so neither I, side is going to assume the other is op acting in good faith to begin with. Not, not to begin yeah, with. Yeah. So uh, uh, it's quite possible that we'll see early allegations of, of Iranian noncompliance. Uh, it's also the case to slide you know, a little bit into the uh, domestic political scene in the United States, but there are forces in the United States, influential actors, who do not want this deal and who have considerable capacity to derail it. So if the U.S. Congress introduces additional sanctions, yeah. for example, Iran has said explicitly this will be grounds for setting the... Well, obviously that will be a deal breaker. Right. But, but surely, I mean, President Obama was pretty clear on day one mm -hmm. when he said that I will veto right. uh, any attempt by Congress to introduce new right. sanctions or to right. stand in the yes. way. Uh, does he have the power to hold firm on his position? Let's talk now about the domestic situation in the U.S., or uh, is the balance of power precarious on Capitol Hill? Well, uh, the pivotal question will be whether Obama has a veto-proof uh, level of support in the Congress. Yeah. And, uh, which, which means for the benefit of our viewers that uh, he needs to have at least two-thirds Correct. of uh, legislators yeah. on his side. No, one-third. Well, oh, that's right, exactly. One-third one has third. to be. Right. In other words, the opponents should not be able to muster more than right. two-thirds. Exactly. Right. So uh, under the U.S. Constitution, to override a presidential veto, the Congress needs a two-thirds majority. Right. Uh, and so that will boil down to whether the president can hold his own uh, party together. Right. And... Uh, Probably he will be able to do so, but, but with a fairly substantial caveat, which is the, in the United States, we've spent uh, since the Iranian revolution in 1979 demonizing Iran. And we've painted a very black and white picture, right? If you go and look at what is the typical view in the United States of Iran, it's the world's leading state sponsor of terror. It's harsh to its own people. It aspires to be a regional hegemon. Uh, we still have this image in our head of Iranians chant chanting death to America. So and, and very everybody, everybody saw Argo a few years ago. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, that revives some yes, of those exactly, images. Exactly. But uh, uh, so if you are an American elected official, there is very little to be gained by uh, generous behavior toward Iran. All right. right. So the last uh, sanctions resolution in, in the United States Senate uh, in 2010, the harsh uh, Obama sanctions, uh, passed the Senate by a vote of 99 to zero, right? right? And the other bloke was probably homesick. I mean, uh, so there is an overwhelming bipartisan consensus that harsh and hostile behavior toward Iran is, is the default position. Yet the, the attempts by some Republicans who scuttled the deal back in April Yes. Uh, we're not successful. So there is Obama a sense thwarted those, and, and uh, he did manage to uh, discipline his own party uh, to hold that together. Um, also, I think what may come out in the debate in the United States is uh, the question of, if not this deal, then what is the alternative? So you have a deal which, whatever its faults and imperfections, uh, introduces, as you very uh, accurately described it, very considerable constraints on Iran's nuclear capability and unprecedented levels of transparency. Right? Uh, now, if you compare this to some perfect deal where Iran rids itself of all of its right. nuclear capabilities, right. it looks relatively uh, inadequate. Yeah. But that's not the real alternative. The real alternative is something like the status quo ante, exactly. right? Which, well, which what has, was which that? prevailed for years, exactly. Exactly. And uh, so what do we know about that? We don't know what Iran would do if the deal falls apart. But we know that they're capable of deploying as many as 4,000 centrifuges in a year. They did that in 2009. 
So people are saying, well, this deal will expire in 10 years, and that's yeah. no, no good. Yeah. But without the deal, in 10 years, Iran could have another 40,000 exactly. centrifuges. Exactly. Right? Iran is mo it was started... And, and have them at Fordo, which is, uh, yeah, which is insulated the from, from bombing, yeah, right. if they uh, wanted to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Iran was starting to modernize its centrifuges, yeah. uh, meaning that they were going to more advanced versions that were more efficient, meaning that they could produce more nuclear material in shorter periods of time. Yeah. Uh, this agreement uh, precludes that for a 10 or 15 year period. Uh, but in the absence of an agreement, in five or 10 years, we could be dealing with thousands of more advanced centrifuges. Yeah. Uh, Iran at its peak, and I think it was the uh, f uh, early 2014 IAEA report, had, had in excess of 11,000 kilograms of enriched material, right. enriched to low levels of right. uh, enrichment. Uh, this agreement will hold Iran to, th to a maximum of 300 kilograms. Uh, Iran, uh, before the, the deal, had an, in round numbers about 400 kilograms of 20% enriched material, which is much closer to right. bomb material. Uh, the agreement allows... Which they wanted for the research reactor. Yes. For medical uh, the, 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 yeah. uh, the deal does not permit them to hold any... Right inventory of 20% right, enriched exactly. material. They're limited to 3.5%. So, right. yeah. And Iran was producing uh, 200 kilograms a month of enriched material, yeah. so its inventory was climbing. And of course, the 200 kilograms would grow yeah. uh, month by month as they introduced more centrifuges. Yeah. That's the most likely alternative to yeah. this deal. And, so, and Obama can very easily point to that scenario to say, look, exactly. uh, what right. we've got is much better. But there was a very angry Terse but angry statement by Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of mm -hmm. Israel, in reaction to the announcement, mm -hmm. uh, where he essentially called this a historic blunder, the world mm -hmm. would come to regret mm -hmm. it. Do you think that's rhetoric on his part because he's under fire domestically? People, some of his critics say, look, why did you have to go and antagonize and get involved mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. domestic American politics in your, and, and perhaps mm -hmm. you overplayed your hand? Uh, so is he grandstanding or, or is there a danger that Israel might actually actively try to scuttle this deal? Well, uh, Israel has many friends in the U.S. Congress, and uh, my expectation is that, that uh, uh, the Israelis will hope that their friends will uh, interfere with this, with this deal. Uh, I believe that... Uh, so, so Netanyahu will continue to lobby and deploy all his, all his clout uh, on Capitol Hill to ensure that this is vetoed in some... Uh, that, uh, that, the presidential veto would be uh, would be overridden. Well, he called a cabinet meeting uh, for yesterday evening, the day of the announcement of the deal, at which he orchestrated the unanimous rejection of the deal by the Israeli cabinet. Right. He then gave a public statement in which he described it as a historic uh, blunder and a, a gamble with the future of uh, Israel. Right. Uh, these don't, to me, seem like the actions of a man who's in a good mood. <laughs> and uh, uh, he could have said, we don't like this deal, or we, but we can live with it. He could have said, right. uh, we would have handled it differently, but we respect the policies of our friends, the Americans. Right. But instead, he said, uh, Barack Obama has make, made a catastrophic error, right? Uh, so whatever he does from here on out, that's a huge signal to his okay. friends and followers yeah. about his position. And I think the, uh, the explanation is, is uh, quite simple. Uh, Netanyahu and a considerable portion of the Israeli body politic believe that, that the Islamic Republic, the theocracy, is committed to the destruction of Israel mm. and that nuclear weapons in the hands of a state that has those aspirations represents right. an existential threat right. to the state of Israel and therefore the only acceptable outcome is for by whatever means, have any, yeah, any, is uh, zero nuclear, exactly. nuclear yeah. capability uh, of any sort yeah. that could lead to a, right. a weapon. Now, reactors are one thing, because a reactor in and of itself doesn't have any right. weapons implications. But zero enrichment is But enrichment or reprocessing, basically there's a uranium path to the bomb and a plutonium path to the bomb. And as far as Israel concern, is concerned, uh, Iran's capabilities in both of those ca categories should be zero. Now, the question people in the region are going to ask is, will Netanyahu's efforts to, to 
derail this deal, be confined to lobbying in the beltway of Washington? Mm -hmm. Or uh, might he do things regionally, um, either militarily, which is the threat that was always mm -hmm. left dangling over the Iranians uh, over the last five or six years? In fact, mm -hmm. the, the talk always was that, look, you better negotiate and give up. Right. Otherwise, the, right. we can't control the, the Israelis, right? <laughs> right. So, is, so, so that threat remains, uh, mm -hmm. or perhaps Israel working with other countries in the Gulf region, mm -hmm. who I presume are equally unhappy at what's yes. happening. Uh, how do you see that angle, the regional angle, playing out? Well, uh, the Israelis and the Saudis in particular have been uh, extremely discomfited by, by this uh, move. In multiple ways, I think uh, uh, they're uneasy about the uh, relatively constructive interaction between right. the United States and Iran, which right. is changing the whole chemistry right. of the region yeah. potentially. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, so it's geopolitical unease rather than nuclear-related unease. I, I think it varies. Right. I think the Saudis are more geopolitical, right. and the Israelis are more okay. more nuclear. Okay. I think there's real concern in the region that. Uh, the lifting of the sanctions is going to strengthen Iran in ways that will enable it to be a more uh, active player in the region. Uh, Undoubtedly. I mean, if you look at the huge manufacturing H, you know, human resources that Iran has, I mean, this is a powerhouse right. waiting to, be, to emerge, as it were. Yeah. Iran is a country of 80 million people. It has a highly educated, elite, uh, illiterate population. Uh, Unlike some of the small Gulf states, which are heavily dependent on oil, Iran has oil, but, but it, it, it's only uh, 15 or so percent That's of right. its economy. It has a lot so, of manufacturing. Uh, yeah. Manufacturing and uh, a lot of world-class talent. So uh, now a lot of that talent has been put to the purpose of evading sanctions over the last right. decade, and I think they've done, done pretty well at that. But there's just no question that, that removing all these constraints and irritants in Iran's economic relations with the world will create enormous opportunities. I also think that uh, there's a substantial interest in uh, Europe and Japan and places like that uh, for the investment opportunities in, right. in, uh, in Iran. Right. For example, Iran is in the early stages of developing its, na its huge natural gas holdings. Um, and so far, the main outside investors have actually been the Chinese. Right. Uh, but the big Western right. energy companies could get in there and right. uh, become, become right. uh, investors and so on. Uh, Iran has not been uh, able to benefit from the kind of advanced technologies right. and the financial capacities of, of the Western energy sector right. since 1979. Right. So there, there's oil and gas right. uh, opportunities. Right. Uh, so I think uh, uh, once the private sector has confidence that these sanctions are really going to be lifted and that you're not going to be running big risks yeah. uh, going into Iran, I think that you're going to see right. uh, so, this, so, this, so this changes investment boom. This changes the geopolitics of the region. This right. changes Iran's economic capabilities. Right. Uh, we don't have very much time, perhaps just a minute, mm. 30 seconds or so. Mm -hmm. But uh, are there domestic concerns within Iran or domestic challenges within Iran that we haven't factored so far? Or do you think that the implementation, at least from the domestic point of view in Iran, will proceed smoothly? Well, Iran has its own tangled domestic politics and they're largely opaque to outsiders. I think we don't understand very well. You have at least, uh, as I see it, uh, several competing structures of power. You have the formal government, you have the theocracy, and you have the revolutionary guard, which is a very powerful and somewhat autonomous uh, right. actor. Right. And we don't understand, or at least I don't understand very well, how those structures interact with one another. But what we know is that, that, that Rouhani and, and uh, Zarif and company have been committed to this path of diplomacy and detente. Uh, and they clearly have the confidence of the Supreme Leader. Uh, they certainly have had right. his, his public support. Right. Uh, having had the opportunity to uh, interact a lot with Iranian colleagues and to visit Tehran a number of times. Uh, I, I would say that one of the most surprising things about that was to realize that a very large fraction of the Iranian elite, I would say from Khatami and the reformers to, through 
Raf Sanjani and the uh, sort of traditional conservatives right. were in favor of some sort of rapprochement with the United States. Right. Now there's still a portion of their spectrum which is rejectionist <laughs> right. and hostile to the United okay. States. We hear those voices. Uh, those are sometimes the loudest voices, so they attract the most attention. Right. Uh, and I think they, they do have some capacity okay. to uh, disrupt. But from what I can tell, the Supreme Leader has backed this uh, initiative uh, he's praised the negotiators. Uh, they've undoubtedly made their peace. They've had months now. So the main concessions were made back in the spring. Uh, so I think they've had time to make their peace with the big compromises that, that, that they've had to make. Right. And uh, so my guess is that, that they may have an easier time than Obama. Right. Okay. Because we're going to have a messy, right. noisy debate. And among other things, in Washington, there's always the unavoidable reality of the uh, polarization, the partisan polarization, right? right? On every major initiative that, of the Obama administration, he's gotten zero Republican votes. Right. There's little reason to think right. they're going to back him on this one. On that note, Professor Steve Muller, I'm afraid we're going to have to end our discussion. Thank you very much for joining us on Rajya Sabha TV. My pleasure. That's it for this episode of IST. Do join us again next week with another guest. Thank you very much. Thank you.